Dr. Zudi Jasser, we call on Dr. Jasser for a number of reasons. We got a lot of friends who are nice guys, but we don't have him down here regularly. He's a nice guy who really knows his stuff about the Middle East. And as a matter of fact, so much so that he's founder and chairman of AIFD, which is what? Uh, the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. See, the minute you say the I word, though, Islamic. you know in this country we're still deeply sensitive since 9-11. And uh, I wonder if those perpetrators in those planes had any idea the ramifications in our heads here in America. Oh, I think they understand America sometimes better than we do. Really? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's why we formed our organization. It's to basically believe and, and, and understand that this is an Islamic problem, Muslim problem, and that we need to lead this effort to combat these radicals. And they're not coming out of nowhere. They're coming out of a, a radical theology that has, in many ways, hijacked my faith. And uh, uh, if the silent masses don't speak up, we're basically complicit. And you can't fix that theology. Only Muslims can fix that theology. And it's not the Quran, I think, that uh, uh, has been uh, problematic, but it's the interpretation of those passages, and it's the way it's been used in this despotic means to legitimize terror, to legitimize uh, coercion, to basically put into place theocracy in Iran and in Taliban, etc. So if Muslims don't start taking back our scripture and going through the enlightenment process that the West went through in the formation of countries like the United States, we won't win this war. I mean, but it, this seems, isn't it seems true of every theology and every scripture. Uh, the misinterpretation or the extremist interpretation of the Bible, the Torah, uh, and, and all of the Holy Scriptures. And some group gets a hold of these things and creates justification for violence. But the thing is, we need to put it in context. I mean, this is not a small problem. If you look back in Europe in the 16th and 17th century, when you had the Church of England uh, uh, controlling government, and you had enlightened philosophers starting to write about the separation of church and state and the need for them to be free to believe or not believe, all these things, there was a vibrant debate going on that ended up in some significant wars. And this is where the Islamic world is. And if we in America continue to dismiss this as, an, as a war against terror, which is only a tactic, this is a, these terrorists have a goal. Their goal is the, is the imposition of Islamic states. And right now, actually, there was a large article by Lawrence Wright in the New Yorker magazine that said that Al-Qaeda, one of the senior Al-Qaeda clerics, Al-Fadl, has said that they are putting aside terror as a tactic. And he is actually putting down bin Laden and saying that that is not right. And he's using scripture to say that it's not right. However, he then compliments the Taliban and says that those are the types of governments we need to put into place. So what we're seeing is Islamism 1.0 is becoming Islamism 2.0, which is they're finding that terror isn't working very well. And they're looking at other means to put into place Islamic states around the world. You used the term just a few moments ago. The great silent masses, that yeah. phrase. You and I have talked about this over and over and over again, probably more than any other single area of this debate. Why are they so silent? Why is it that the world of Islam doesn't stand up enraged? Well, I think many of us are. I think that if you look in the Middle East, those that do speak up are either killed or put in jail. Most of the targets of terror in Iraq and Iran and Syria uh, and elsewhere are Muslims that have been speaking up against these governments and theocrats. And also, I think we forget human nature. I mean, in our own elections, in our own activists in America, it's a small percent that usually act up and, and speak out. So put on top of that governments that aren't free like ours, but are despotic and societies where people that don't toe the line are all of a sudden disappear, uh, this is why. I mean, there's a significant tribal community problem, and especially in America where we're a minority, those of us that tried to say that, wait a minute, before you look outside, let's fix our own house. And we're looked upon as Uncle Tom's, as people that don't toe the line, and when in fact I'm doing this out of love for my faith. And love for your country. You, you have uh, represented this country in the military. How many years in the Navy? 11 years. Uh, do you get criticized for that? No, no. I mean, I've never been criticized for my service, but uh, certainly they try to link that now to say that I'm part of some conspiracy theory or that this our organization of reform work is actually part of some uh, governmental covert project and all of this nonsense. And, and this is just, we're, we're citizens that feel that the government can't do this, feel that uh, uh, non-Muslims can't do this. Only Muslims can 
lead a movement to separate and marginalize the radicals and those that abuse scripture. And it's our job to do that. And Aren't you a tiny minority, though? I mean, in the total American Muslim society, uh, your moderation uh, is a voice that I hear represented by you and a couple of other people. Uh, I think that if you look at the media uh, and who's speaking out, who's given opportunities like you give me and others, it's, it is a small minority. But if we start to turn our lens on the voices like mine, there's many out there and they can, I think, fill the studios around the country in interviews and, and uh, they're there and I can rattle off a number of names, but they're just ignored because they're not part of the minority complex, uh, victimology complex that likes to be put up and say, oh, this is a, a discrimination, et cetera. We have an internal problem that we need to fix, and uh, we just need to be given more opportunities to speak out about it. What about the women in the picture behind Barack Obama, the television picture, who happen to have traditional Muslim headwear on, moved out of the picture, and, uh, and then all of a sudden there's another issue. Uh, wait a minute, he doesn't want to be associated with them. And uh, I mean, these are the kinds of no. petty things that are going on on a daily basis. Uh, I think that is a perfect symptom. I mean, that is, it is absurd that a, a candidate running for president would remove somebody from his backdrop because of the way they looked. But we should look at this, why did that happen? It happened because the candidates, both of them, uh, and uh, uh, probably more so Obama has been very confused on how to address this issue. On the one hand, he wants to deny any association with Muslims. On the other hand, uh, he is, is reaching out to the Muslim community as part of this victim orientation complex that he feels they have post 9-11, and yet there's been no explanation of what his strategy is globally in the war of ideas. I want you to tell me how you would advise him. Uh, because to tell you the truth, if I had emails constantly permeating uh, cyberspace about my secret life as an Al-Qaeda operative uh, trying to take over America, I probably would be a bit sensitive, too. This is Pat McMahon. Zudi Jasser is here. We're going to be talking about Iran. We're going to be talking about nuclear capability and Israel and all of those things. Everything we can sandwich into the next segment of The Pat McMahon Show.